What's up, everyone? Hello, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We got Ron Vargas producing and directing. We got Robert Griffiths as our guest. What's up, Robert? It's good to be here. Great to see you. It's been too long, even though it's only been a week or more. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Griffiths is running for governor of California in 2018. Mm -hmm. He also ran for president in 2016. Mm -hmm. He's got a great background, banking, good interest in politics. We're going to talk about some of these ideas that are very unique, that are different, that are strategic. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see exactly how we can implement them into the world, maybe inspire people to care more about them. So let's talk, let's talk about this journey. So mm -hmm. what, what actually... Uh, what got you here to today? Like, where, where were you when you, you know, you were at Stanford mm -hmm. and then you got into banking? So maybe tell us a bit about that and where, how it led to politics. Yeah, well, it, it actually started, my first clear memory was when I was seven, sitting in front of the television, watching states on a map turn blue and red. Yeah. And it was uh, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford in 76. Uh, and I was absolutely mesmerized. My parents were talking about it and even got into an argument because my dad changed his mind on who he voted for. He voted for Carter, uh, even though he's, he's, for the most part, a Republican. And I've just had the bug for politics probably before then, but that's my first clear memory. And I've always been political, but I never really got involved in politics till about 2011 for the 2012 presidential race. And then, you know, I ended up running in 16. So it's really taken flight. So from seven until, you know, 2016, what were those kind of, you know, as you're measuring economic systems and you're really studying them and you're, mm -hmm. and you're getting used to figuring out what new strategies could be implemented, uh, what, what, what within that economics and the political span between the age of seven and 2016 were kind of like your big ahas? Yeah, well, you know, my parents were Republicans, and I thought of myself as a Republican. And I've been thinking about that saying that if you're, if you're young and not a Democrat, you have no heart. Um, but if you're old and not a Republican, you have no brain. And uh, when I was young, I had much more of a brain than a heart, is, is one way I look at it. Um, so I was very interested in economics, problem solving, going about things logically, but I was less in touch with my heart and emotions and people. Uh, I was a little bit more objective, which led me to studying uh, systems and information engineering at the University of Virginia as an undergraduate, minoring in economics and the like. But I went to a college Republicans meeting with my roommate who was involved in that organization, and I quickly found out I was not a Republican. Um, I said something at that meeting and you could hear a pin drop. I just, I, I just walked out of that meeting going, wow, I'm not a Republican, so what am I? What, what did you say, do you remember? Well, uh, a friend of mine who was about 15 or 16, but a, a first year student at the University of Virginia was running for student council president. He was kind of a, a genius, an engineering student. He would always wear a Metallica shirt or anthrax or some other heavy metal. He had a thick Vietnamese accent. Uh, Luang Tran was his name, and he considered himself an anarchist, and I didn't really know what that was. I just thought he was cool, he was smart, I liked him, and I advocated for this anarchist at a re college Republicans meeting, and they looked at me like I was from another planet. Yeah, yeah. Because I said something about, you know, let's really fuck with the system, and, and they were just like, you know, Republicans, just my language and, and just this sort of energetic, youthful approach was not where these guys, mostly men, were coming from. And so I kind of wandered in the wilderness and um, eventually found myself uh, philosophically drawn towards, you know, I read some Ayn Rand and I, and I eventually, you know, got involved, uh, you know, I registered eventually as a libertarian, voted libertarian and, and got somewhat involved in the libertarian party in 2011 and 12, um, and then found myself running as a candidate for president in that party in 16. So 
when you say things like, you know, let's fuck with the system, mm -hmm. that's, that to me actually is good. You're, you know, you're thinking outside of the box. You're thinking about ways to, uh, to be eccentric or unusual rather than the whole 99 sheep walk in one direction. Well, you want to be that black sheep that walks in the other. Mm -hmm. That's been a reoccurring theme on our show. We talk about that a lot with our guests. What were some of those uh, strategies that you were boiling in as you became libertarian, as you started you know, running for mm -hmm. governor and everything, and for president? What, what were you thinking about the economic change that you wanted to make? Um, and mm -hmm. what are some of those thoughts? Well, I, I think uh, you know, the, the Libertarian Party, which is very small, very poorly funded, it's all volunteer. They put all their money into putting the presidential candidate on the ballot in 50 states. And um, so they don't really get anybody elected. And, and they're not, they don't have the best track record of attracting good candidates. Um, so, um, but, but their principles, it, they have principles. They call themselves the, the party of principle. And their principles are very simple. And I like to keep it simple, stupid, as they say, K-I-S-S. And, um, now, sometimes they make leaps with those principles, the policies that the general public isn't ready for, or at least not now. Um, and some of those uh, responsible, or some of those uh, keep it simple stupids are things like personal responsibility. Yeah, I mean, the, the ethos is don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Uh, you know, or, you know, don't kill and don't steal, if you want to refer to the Ten Commandments yeah. for, for people yeah. who, who are religious in this country. And... And I, I think what makes the libertarians different is they apply those principles not just to the general public, and I think most people would agree to those two principles, yeah. but th there's a bit of a red pilling that the government is actually, you know, may not be following them. And, and that's where I think the uh, libertarian party mm -hmm. is a black sheep politically, and they say very challenging, co confrontational sometimes things about taxation or warfare yeah. Uh, they're the drug war, that sort of thing. And they've been out ahead and they've been right on things like, like marriage equality. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, we basically have legalized marijuana in the state of California now. Mm -hmm. That's a ballot measure that passed in 16. So I, I think their principles are good. And I think spending some time in that party and more importantly in that philosophy has, has really, you know, I'm clear with myself and I can be clear to the public with, I think, simple principles that most people would, would say are reasonable. Um, and, and, and it allows me to challenge the political establishment and mess with it, to use a different word than yeah, the word yeah. I used earlier. Yeah. And, and really kind of think outside the box and be creative instead of this politics as usual and the division you know, between the main two parties. You know, my party, the Democratic Party, which I'm now in, and, and the Republican Party, that's, that's kind of a tired old fight. Yeah. So as you're messing with it and tinkering with it, um, maybe tell us a bit about this, uh, this, banking, this banking background, this economic interest. Sure. Well, what brought me to California was Stanford. So after the University of Virginia, I, went, I worked a summer in D.C. for a Beltway Bandit. And, and then I, uh, in, in the... Uh, uh, a telecom, essentially, for, uh, for, for the armed forces. And, and then I, I started uh, school at Stanford in fall of 91, majored in engineering economic systems, a department that's now called decision science. Mm -hmm. And I got a job with a bank that became Providian Financial, mm -hmm. um, which was late, much later on acquired by WAMU, which fell in the housing crisis of 2008. So that firm's assets are now part of J.P. Morgan Chase. But I was in the banking industry for about 10 years and did just about mostly credit card, which was a booming business. Definitely. And Providian was a sister company to Capital One. They were founded by the same group mm -hmm. of people, just half of them founded Cap One in Richmond, Virginia, and the other half founded Providian, which was at one time the third largest credit card bank in the country and the most profitable profits after taxes even approaching a billion dollars a year. I mean, serious, mm -hmm. serious money. Mm -hmm. And so what, as you're doing all of this immersion into credit card and into banking, what were some of the things that maybe boiled up to the surface for you that you thought were really important to this and, and with this parlay into libertarianism? What were kind of the... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, there was a professor at Stanford who taught a course that I took called a voluntary social system, where this was a society where all interactions were voluntary, consensual, and ideally peaceful, um, or the you know consequences for activity that wasn't peaceful, that was forceful or violent, and. Um, he never used the word libertarian. He, did, he wanted to be very apolitical about yeah. it and, and analytical like a scientist. Yeah. He was a decision scientist. And, you know, in banking, I learned the importance of making a profit for shareholders. Mm -hmm. And the employees were shareholders, very mm -hmm. much so. Mm -hmm. um, but also serving the customer was, was a really important lesson because you, if you don't serve the customer, you won't have customers. So I learned the agency of a company was to serve its employees, its shareholders, and its customers, and the general public. So, so Providian, we did a lot of charitable work, especially in the Bay Area and Louisville, Kentucky, where we had significant operations. And also, we had a formula. Like, this was a bank run by engineers. Like, a, we hired a lot of people yeah. from Stanford, and after I started recruiting at UVA, we, we hired over 100 people from UVA, you know, a whole 3,000 miles away. Yeah. The, the president asked me, Rob, where do we get more people like you? You know, we're not getting enough out of Berkeley and Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I learned more at UVA than I did at Stanford. So boom, we started hiring there. So we, you know, we applied what we called the formula and just optimize and maximize profits um, as, as well as serving customer needs. And so we were very profitable. But that bank made a few classic blunders, and, and that's why they're they're essentially a part of Chase today. Um, but 10 years in banking was enough, and it was a bit too mechanical. It is. How, you know, how does one even balance between maximizing profits for shareholders and providing customers with what they need? Well, you have to do both to survive. Um, and um, uh, that's what all successful companies do. Microsoft wouldn't have made Bill Gates a billionaire had it been a bad operating system, bad software, and so forth. So um, the sort of idyllic um, capitalist in the best sense of the word as opposed to the, the poorer sense of, of what capitalism can be is you serve your customer. The customer is in charge, not the company. And if you serve your customer best, give them the best product or service at the lowest price, and what Providian did well is they served people who had had bankruptcies and couldn't get credit cards elsewhere, and they helped rebuild people's credit, um, and they did it better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Re helping people, helping them rebuild their credit. Yeah. Now, okay, so now we're, you know, in 2016, the, there, was a, there was both California governor run as well in 2016, as well as the presidential run. Um, well, in, in 11 and 12, I helped out Gary Johnson. Cool. I discovered him actually as a Republican standing near Ron Paul on a, mm -hmm. on a debate stage in 2011. And I just really liked him, even though, uh, you know, to the extent, you know, I was a libertarian at that time. I just, a lot of the candidate is you got to like the candidate. Yeah. And I just liked Gary at that time better than Ron <laughs> Paul. And Excuse me. Um, I supported his campaign, got his campaign a speaking engagement at Stanford Business School, uh, and that gave me a taste of it. And then in 16, January of 16, which was a little late in the game, which is why I wasn't able to mount um, a, a serious campaign, but I, I, I showed up at the National Convention in Orlando on Memorial Day weekend in 2016 as a presidential candidate, filed with the FEC, did all the requirements, and I got votes, uh, nominating votes on, on the Saturday, um, but, but I, I didn't have enough to be in the C-SPAN debates or in the final Sunday ballot. But I was, it's a small party, and I knew Gary Johnson, I know John Mac, I still know Gary Johnson, I know John McAfee, I know Austin Peterson, who's running for Senate as a Republican in Missouri. And so it was a great experience to get my feet wet in politics, a national convention. Yeah, correct. And I was in the thick of it on the floor, yep. helping out the other candidates when I was no longer in it and they were. And I was, you know, I had some really positive interactions with Austin Peterson, who finished second to Gary. So what are some of these, uh, what actually occurs behind the drapes? This mm -hmm. is very interesting at the um, national convention in Orlando. 
Uh, it, it was fascinating. It's one of the best weeks of my life. Um, politics to me is almost a spiritual endeavor. And uh, the people who were there were so inspired. They, they had paid with their own money uh, to be there and to be delegates. They were passionate about candidates and principles and policies. It's very important to everybody that, that we as a party picked the right person. And, and it, there was no obvious choice. And it took two ballots before Gary you know, won. Um, but it was just so great. I, I had connected mostly with libertarians through social media. I, I didn't really know a lot of them, even though there are a lot of them in the Bay Area. But to get together with about a thousand people of a political ideology, where it was really more about people at that point than principle, and um, the competition was fierce. And, and it was really important to me, and I think everybody else there, that we, we pick the best ticket possible, which I don't think we did. So the national convention was just for the Libertarian choice for 2016? Yeah, Memorial Day weekend of 16 in Orlando, just a week or two before the Pulse nightclub shooting. And you don't think that you picked the right candidate? No, I did not vote for Gary Johnson or his preferred vice presidential candidate, uh, Governor Weld of Massachusetts, two former Republican mayors, and they're great guys, but it you was... You preferred Austin? I actually voted for Austin twice, and I voted for... Uh, another gentleman whose name escapes me, and I, I apologize to him for not thinking of him at the moment, but um, I met pretty much everybody who was anybody in that movement at that convention, so it was a real That's good. baptism for me, and it was hard work, but it was fun and thrilling, and the taste yeah. for that. You know, I started telling people I'll run for president you know, in a much more serious way in 2020, and then, and that's when people started to suggest running for governor of California, which I'm doing. On the way, yeah. So what is, what is the process for the, both the governor and the president? How does one even cons do this whole process? What do you need to do? You need to apply with, uh, with a commission, and then you need to get signatures. What is this like? Yeah, well, for president, it was actually very easy with the Libertarian Party, whereas at the major parties, I can't even imagine what that takes. You know, you've got to win the nomination. You've got to go through a long primary. It takes a lot of money. You need to be established in those parties. And um, I'm fairly well established in the Libertarian Party now and could go back, but um, I'm a Democrat, and, and, and sort of right now there's no looking back. Um, but for governor, there was quite a bit of work. Um, there's a lot of forms to fill out. There's a filing. You either pay a, about a $4,000 filing fee, which is about 2% of the governor's salary is how they do that. Or you gather, I think it's up to about 8,000 signatures, about 50 cents a signature. Um, but then once you pay that, you have you know, basically four weeks to gather. If you haven't gathered signatures already, you need another 65. For, for, for nominating signatures. And, um, and, and I did gather signatures for that. I actually paid the filing fee um, as opposed to gather 8,000 signatures. I just thought mm -hmm. it was more economic. But I went out and gathered a lot, probably more than half of the signatures myself. And, yep. and that was a great walk the street, talk to people on the street. Because yep. there's, there's nothing more real than trying to ask somebody's signature. Yeah. And, and as the candidate, I, I was a lot more successful than my volunteers because people really appreciated being able to ask me some questions. And you get to hear what they want as well from their candidates. You get to learn from that. And then they get to learn from what you want to build. So, okay, so then um, a filing fee or $8,000 signatures, 4K or 8,000 signatures, and then 65 more to get on the... Um, on the ballot, ballot which I, I am officially on the ballot. I got the letter from Alex Padilla, Secretary of State, Wednesday last week, and it was, put, it was officially announced, all the candidates for governor. How many are Thursday. there now? I believe it's about 25, Candidate. but it's really only 10 from the two major parties. Yeah. Uh, myself and some Democrats, and probably a bit, there's about four or five Republicans and maybe five or six Democrats. Um, and then, and then so, a lot of peace and freedom, green, couple of libertarian gentlemen. Green Party, yeah. yeah who, who we both know, at least one of them. Mm -hmm. So then, so then uh, what actually happened? So you got June 5th is the voting day? June 5th is the open primary. And yeah. to me, that's for all the marbles. Um, 
because with 25 candidates, regardless of party, like the parties don't get to choose who's on the November ballot. They don't even get to choose who's on the June ballot. Um, but the top two vote-getters of all the statewide offices and, and, and the local ones as well are the only two to appear on the November ballot according to this open primary, what some people call a jungle primary, wow. which, which only exists in, I believe, Louisiana and California, to my knowledge. It could be another state or two. What, what would it be otherwise instead of the jungle? Well, normally the primary on June 5th, uh, only Republican voters could vote to choose which Republican appears on the November ballot. Yeah. But what it is now is it's open to everybody, all 25 of us, and uh, the top two, and only the top two appear on the November ballot. And this, this is what's very, I think, undemocratic about this open primary law in California, is there are no write-ins allowed in November. So June 5th is everything, the top two. Yeah, and no in 16, we had Kamala Harris and another woman, both of them Democrats, were on the ballot in November for Senate, the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. And Kamala Harris won over the other Democrat. But a lot of Republicans were scratching their heads going, I have to choose between two Democrats? Yeah. So in, in this state, the Democrats dominate. And, and most pundits are, are picking you know, that it will be two Democrats for governor as well, which it could be. There were, you know, there are a couple of Republican candidates that are trying to play second. So, uh, so after this jungle phase, then the top two, so you only vote for one on January or in June 5th, and then, then the top two vote getters show up in November. Mm -hmm. So normally across the states, there's only Republicans come and vote for only a Republican and Democrats would only come and vote for only one of the Democrats and then mm -hmm. the top two would show up on the ballot. Uh, actually, only one from each party. Yeah. So in the, the old days, you'd have one party. Republican, one Democrat, one Libertarian, one Green and Peace and Freedom, and so on. And then you'd have about half a dozen on the ballot in November, whereas now it's two. Yeah. And you can, you know, very frequently with California, you have two Democrats yeah. to choose from. Okay. All right. So... So for me, it's June 5th is everything. If, yeah. if, I, if, if I finish top two, then I got five months to just beat whoever else is on the ballot. You know, could be Gavin Newsom, for example. All right. So, what are some of the policies that you want to bring? Okay. Well, my two biggest ones, um, and and a lot of this is, I you know I thought of these ideas myself, but I found them being done elsewhere. Um, so these these are not unique ideas, but they are unusual for politics. Um, and, and the first one had to do with the state's debt, uh, which most politicians won't even acknowledge. I asked the two Republican uh, candidates about the state debt, and it, it's really, they didn't even think about it. They don't have any plans for it. But the state is over $2 trillion in debt, uh, if you include the counties. And the interest on that debt is over 100 billion dollars a year, which eats up more than 20% of our budget. So the economist and the engineer and the problem solver in me sees that 20% budget. And that $2 trillion, the, none of that principle is being paid down. It's going to the moon. It's astronomical, just like the federal debt. And if nothing else, I know I can bring to the attention to the state of California that over 20% of their tax dollars are paying interest on a debt and none of their tax dollars are paying down the principal. Because in Sacramento, politics yeah. as usual is spend more than you take in in tax revenue and run up this debt, which is now just $2 trillion as a sum so obscene, it can never be paid. So I saw that as an opportunity. I was like, aha, I want to make that debt go away. So I have a plan to make the debt go away, including the $100 billion a year in interest which is eating up 20% of our budget. We get rid of that, we won't need these gas taxes that everybody is complaining about because that's what they passed in, in not the most straightforward and fair manner um, to, to keep a balanced budget because states have to balance. They're not like the federal government who can um, not balance and then just use the federal reserve money to cover the, the gaps. States, if you know, they can't go bankrupt. They have to keep their head above water. 
we're all waking up every day and just thinking about well, how am I going to make my money? How am I going to eat my food? When mm -hmm. am I going to go to sleep? Is my sexual partner beautiful enough? You know, mm -hmm. this is, these are things that we survival, survival. So the last thing that comes to people's minds is our state is in a $2 trillion deficit. It's hard to think about. It is. And it's very abstract to think about a $2 trillion deficit. Mm -hmm. What the hell is that? So, okay. So over the last couple of decades, we've spent more than we've brought in via tax dollars, driving us into a deficit and having $2 trillion with the debt. Mm -hmm. And we spend 20% of the current budget which is 140 billion a year at the state level, and including the counties, and you know it gets up to about 200, 250 billion. We spend a, how, then we spend 20 percent of 150 billion. Well, it's it's really, yeah, it's uh, these these numbers are a little larger, but to keep them around, the state as a whole, including counties and municipalities, uh, you're looking at about 500 billion dollar in budgets and about a hundred billion of that is Goes paying through. interest on debts. And not even the principal, which is crazy. No principal's being which paid. Which is crazy. It so is, it's irresponsible. It is, it's, it's a, so that, okay, so now how do we take the debt and how do we say that, okay, the debt is something that we are no longer responsible for because we're gonna take this other 20% of our taxpayer dollars and we're gonna fund it into California's economic growth or mm -hmm. so how do we how do we do that well it's a complex problem it's a hard problem and we're paying through it through the nose in a way that's intractable right 20 percent and growing two trillion and growing so we have to just say no we have to put our foot down and voters have not had anybody to vote for who's going to put their foot down and say no to debt no to interest no to irresponsible uh, spending more than you take in and I'm the guy to do that so I would restructure that debt um, tell us about that not unlike a bankruptcy but it's not a bankruptcy um, at, at, at the most confronting it's that we're not going to pay all of it matter of fact um, we, we need to figure out how much of it we're going to pay and how much of it we're not going to pay um, we but the bottom line is we need to make it go away we need to pay it down or just write it off and, and make, make it go away and make that 20% and growing hit go away. And restructuring it. And you know, this is somewhat like Bernie Sanders saying he wanted to forgive the over $1 trillion in student loan that is strangling so many educated people in this country who are saddled with student loan debt they can't pay and can't write off in a bankruptcy. Um, but I, I, I think with Bernie Sanders, people asked him, well, what does that look like? What about these banks that loan the trillion dollars? What about them? Yep. And, and he didn't really go that far into the economics and the mathematics of it. Um, so to me, there is a moral and ethical issue of who gets paid and who doesn't. There is an economic and financial issue, which is, look, we need to clean up the state's finances, but how do we do it without hurting anybody or hurting people the least? Um, and then there's the political question, because if the people who don't get paid influence the elections, well, no candidate who says this and is going to hurt the interests that have a say, unfortunately, in the election. So if I were to hurt California's voters or hurt California state employees by not paying them on their bonds, well, they're not going to vote for any candidate who's going to you know, suggests restructuring or even defaulting on some of those. So, you know, my calculus around who gets paid and who doesn't is that if you live in California, if you are a human being as opposed to an institutional investor like a bank or a hedge fund or a, or a government, um, so the more human you are, the poorer you are, and the closer to California you live, the more you're going to get paid. And an example I always use is a uh, uh, a couple of grandparents, you know, uh, seniors who have maybe, you know, probably higher than average retirement savings, like say $100,000. What if they have every penny in California bonds? I'm not going to default a dime on them. They're going to get every penny of principal, every penny of interest. Whereas a large hedge fund in the hundreds of billions of dollars 
and I don't know, it could be China, Russia, Brazil, it, you know, it, in theory it could be in the United States, but if they own 10 million in California bonds, you know, my first approach to them would be, would you please donate those to the citizens of California and help us get out of debt? So the first pass would be voluntary and choice driven, like let's all work together to help. Um, but at some point, there could be some large, rich institutional investors where, where the loss would essentially be what I call taking a haircut. You know, a hedge fund that's so enormous that has um, uh, an amount of California bonds um, who can afford a loss. You know, uh, grandma and grandpa can't afford to lose 100000 They can't afford to lose 10000 They're going to get paid. But a huge hedge fund where 10 million in California bonds is, is like a drop in the bucket. You know, they're, they're investors. They, they know when they invest in corporate bonds or even government bonds in foreign nations that there's no 100% return. Um, so if, if they don't agree to donate uh, those bonds, in other words, they would offer to, to not redeem them. But if they don't take that offer and if when push comes to shove, we've got to default on either a fraction or possibly the entirety of bonds. But we would do this on a case-by-case -case basis. So the important thing to me is that no, not a hair on the head of a human being gets hurt by this restructuring of bonds. Uh, human beings get paid super rich large institutional investors that can afford to take a bit of a haircut on their California bonds you know, that's how we would do it. You know, we do it very humanely. Um, and uh, because there's no easy way to make two plus trillion dollars disappear. Somebody's going to have to take a loss. But this, this debt, I don't believe, is legitimate. The California citizen and voter has not authorized two trillion dollars in debt. I think most citizens don't even know about it or that the interest. I talked to two Republican candidates for governor and they didn't even know. They had no plans for this. It just wasn't on their radar. Well, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, I'm an economist, and 20% of the budget just jumped right out at me. And I said, okay, oh, it's, it's based on a debt that is in some ways illegitimate, not authorized by the people. Well, we need to fix that. And um, so, so restructuring that debt is my answer to it. And I think it's possible to make that two trillion down to zero by the end of a four year term. And, and we could restructure and you know, default as much as 50 to 60% of it in the first year. And that would save the state 50 to $60 billion a year. And you don't need a gas tax, you can actually repeal it. And a gas tax has hurt the poor more than anybody. The poor pay all the taxes, that's one myth. There's this myth that you can soak the rich in taxes. And the tax, you know, most people who know, know that investors and business owners have loopholes where they pay no income taxes. And business owners pay no more than 20% federal and state. Whereas employees, which is most of us, we pay 20 to 60% in federal and state income taxes. That's just income taxes. So um, this gas tax is a tax on the poor. It's a tax on the vulnerable. And I want to be a candidate who's not looking out for the rich necessarily and the special interests only, but you know, I want to help out the common person the average Californian who works hard or just struggles to survive, the single mom with three kids. And I have another plan to help everybody as well. Let's, let's before we get there, let's unpack this more because this sure, is so, sure. so interesting. Yeah. There's, there's the whole, let's start about it, let's start with it from the end of what you said, which sure. is that the, is it true that poor people pay the majority, poor and middle class pay a majority of all the taxes. Who are earning wages. Who earn wages pay, because that's about what 90 plus percent of people are either poor or middle class people. Mm -hmm. So because of that, then those that that's where a majority of the taxpayer dollars comes from is that larger group of people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there are very few people that are making 100,000 or more per year. Yeah or hundreds of thousands. There are a lot of married couples where one or both partners make a hundred grand or more, and you need that to afford to live in the Bay Area or parts of Los Angeles. Some of those people are paying marginal income tax rates of up to 60%, but most of us 
are down around the 20 to 30, 20 to 40, and that's where a huge amount of the revenue. There just aren't many people making $500,000 a year. Yeah. So you just there's yeah. just not much money there. The tax base is the people who make anywhere from 15,000 a year, you know, to 80 or 100. That's where almost all the money is. And then doing things like putting a tax on gas or on other basic commodities that that group of people really uses a lot is takes away from their paycheck to paycheck lifestyle. Yeah, sales taxes in particular really soak the poor. And gas taxes, either directly or indirectly. Uh, that's, you know, because a rich person, another 10 cents a gallon or 40 cents a gallon with diesel is, is, is not going to make cause them pain. Whereas the small business owner who's got a bunch of trucks making deliveries, you know, they're taking a bath. That's huge. And, yeah. Okay, so then let's unpack the first part of the point, which was that it's even possible in the first place to get rid of um, trillions of dollars of debt uh, to default on it. Mm -hmm. and it. So what what Bernie proposed to forgive student loan debt mm -hmm. was very, very interesting. Um, but the, like you said, who pays for it, right? And, right. and it's the same question that you brought up, um, which is who would pay for your uh, forgiveness that you plan for the, mm -hmm. who, who in, like you directed, who owns the bonds is the question. Is, mm -hmm. it the, is it the ma and pa that own the bonds or is it the hedge fund that owns the bonds, California bonds? So, okay, so as we unpack that more, let's say that, you know, amicably, amicably we get people to donate their, bonds and then that's step one maybe step two is the ones that refuse to because they want to they also have to deal with their margins and their bottom lines and they don't want to just donate mm -hmm. the their 10 million dollar of, of the california bonds mm -hmm. how do you tell them that well whether or not you want to we're going to do this because mm -hmm. we need to grow california well we have the willpower to do it like i have the willpower to do it, and um, it takes a lot of willpower to say, I'm gonna default on some bonds. Because frankly, it may even be, you could run into legal issues there. Um, but, you know, I'm running on this as my top issue. So if I get elected governor, and I take office on January 9th of, 19, of uh, 2019, then I will have a mandate on this issue. And the people will have spoken, and so, and the people get what they want in a democracy, in the ideal sense of the word. So, so you would propel a vote on this? I, would, I will go to the slab on this. And um, I believe in it so strongly that, um, you know, I, I don't want this to be too soft of a line. Yeah. Uh, we, we need to show some moral fortitude to deal with real economic problems. Yeah. And we need to show some real political courage. Like, yeah. I'm not a career politician. You know, I don't have to answer to, to any political party necessarily. And I just want to do what's right for the people. And, and I think the people have spoken to that. You can see that in the success of a Bernie Sanders or even a Donald Trump who defeated the Republican establishment and then the Democratic establishment in the form of Hillary. And I, I think people are tired of politics as usual and they, they want to hear a unique voice who is actually addressing the real problems instead of just playing the game. Yeah. Man, 20% of the budget is crazy. Mm -hmm. Damn, that's so much money that is just paying interest, not even the principal. It just seems like such a waste. How can we direct that towards education, mm -hmm. towards reducing suffering, towards flourishing California in all mm -hmm. of its different ways? That's really important to address and to get people mm -hmm. inspired by. So, okay, talk to us about the second. Okay. So I think one of the thing I want to do is um, a lot of times uh, voters look rather cynically at politicians and say, yeah, he or she is saying this, but they never deliver or they never offer anything very simple and tangible. And what I'm offering is um, the same thing that Australia offers people to vote every national election. They have low turnout as we do in California in the primaries. And as I said, June 5th is everything. We pick our top two, so we better pick two good candidates to choose from in November, um, instead of just two identical candidates. Um, 
So even if we have two Democrats, I'm sure I would be extremely, you know, I have a lot in common with Gavin Newsom as, as a fellow Democrat, but I don't hear him or anybody else talking about the debt this way. Mm -hmm. So what they do in Australia to encourage voter turnout and legitimize their elections is they tax everybody $200. It's like a voting tax. And when you vote, you get $200 for voting. So if you vote, there's no, it, it balances out the tax, whereas the people who don't vote take a $200 hit. And so what I'm promising is that everybody who participates in the June 5th primary and the November general election, that as governor in January of 2019, everybody who votes in June will receive $200, and everybody who votes in November will receive another $200. So that's $400 cash on the barrel head for everybody just for exercising your civic responsibility and voting. And you know, I, I, I want to help people out. This two to $400, you know, your millionaires aren't going to care. Um, but a single mom with three kids on welfare um, is going to care because $400 buys a lot of groceries. It helps pay rent. You know, that's a lot of money. And um, so I want to give a simple, tangible benefit. If I'm going to save 50, 50 to $60 billion in my first year and in interest on the debt, 100 billion a year for four years, potentially, and wipe out a two to two and a half trillion dollar debt, with that 50 to $60 billion of savings in the first year, if 10 million people vote in June and November, that's $4 billion, a lot of money. But if I'm going to save more than 10 times that yeah. in order to get elected and make that happen and make sure that the special interests and in politics as usual doesn't clean up in the June 5th primary with low voter turnouts, we need a huge turnout. So I'm, this is a chance for people to get some help, to encourage them to participate. And, and, and you know, I want people to be aware of the debt issue. Um, yeah. And, and the $200 for voting twice, $400, people always say, well, how are you going to pay for that? Mm -hmm. And then I could point to the more nuanced and complex Correct. debt issue, which really, in a way, isn't that complex. Um, but so those are the things. And, and my job as a candidate is not just to have a good plan for governance, which the debt um, uh, restructuring is about, but is to win. My job is to win on June 5th, to finish top one or two, so that I am on the ballot. Otherwise, I'm just whistling Dixie. Yeah. So the $200 is putting my money where my mouth is and, and, and offering that um, to people in need and to voters to get out there and vote on June 5th so we can make this debt restructuring and, and the rest of my plans happen. Because you know I can't defeat the Gavin Newsoms, the other Democrats and the Republicans on the ballot um, just with good ideas. I need to be a bit of a populist. Yeah. And, and I, I, you know, some people have questioned this as uh, unusual, and, um, but, but I look at it as helping people out as well. In addition to, I need to do things like this to, to get attention. I want to help people so they can help me so yeah. that on January of next year I can help them. So I have to win on June 5th. I can't just have a moral victory and say, oh, I ran and got 5%. I yeah. need to finish in the top two. Yeah, to actually be able to make the impact that you want to make. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, I think what Australia is doing is it, it's interesting. I don't know what's the best sort of way across the world to encourage people to exercise their civic duty of actually going and voting. Um, and we should explore what that is. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people that are uh, li libertarian would say that, you know, just let people be, let them do their thing. Um, don't force them to vote. Don't tax them $200 just so that they go and exercise the civil liberty. Yeah. But, but at the same time, the, the general idea of that's very interesting because it's not a spectator sport. The democracy is a participant. Right. And there's no $200 tax here. This is just not here, $200 for here. What I'm proposing is yeah. no tax, $200. And the, the average, you know, most people, even very educated and professional people, are fairly low information voters. They go on name recognition and very simple things like Bernie's forgive the debt or, or the president's I'm going to build a wall and make Mexico pay for it. You know, it's very clear where those two gentlemen stood. And uh, simplicity, keep it simple, 
yeah. I think works. And uh, two hundred, two to four hundred dollars of assistance is tangible. It's simple. And, and if, but that is coming with the package of you have to be able to right. then convince. That's the responsible piece. Yeah, you have to convince your mm -hmm. debt forgiveness to also work. So yeah. that way they get paid the two hundred. And, and I'm addressing things like the housing crisis, immigration, strangling regulations and taxes. All those other things are part of my plan. But I, I think the high level issues have to be easy. I'm the guy who's going to make the debt disappear and free up 20% of our budgets. I'm the guy who's that, going to... That's the big story. Yeah. That's the big story, yeah. And, and, but that's kind of, it's a bit nuanced and there's a, you know, some people aren't getting paid, so it's a little edgy. Yeah. Um, but the two to, two to $200 for voting, $400 total, that's tangible, that's simple. Go out and vote. And I'm, I'm, I'm challenging all the other candidates for governor to sign a pledge also offering $200, because I think it's such a good idea that I would challenge uh, Gavin Newsom and the two Republicans and uh, the other two higher polling Democrats to, to sign this pledge, because if they don't, I will differentiate myself from the crowd. Because some people think it's politically, just like the debt thing, you know, it's political suicide to mention the debt. Don't let the voters know about that, because it's so embarrassing and nobody has any plans to deal yeah, with it. Yeah. And, and this $200, traditional politicians you know, some people, you know, don't like it and they find it disingenuous or some kind of a scheme. But, you know, we, we, we have to do things differently and I have to do things differently to distinguish myself. And, you know, I'm a problem solver and my two problems right now are f fix California's fiscal problems that are driving the middle class out of the state. Nobody's left here but poor homeless people and the very rich. And the, the debt restructuring does that. My other job is to get elected. And this $200 for voting in June and another 200 in November, that is a way to bring people out, get assistance, um, but also get the people who don't otherwise vote to vote. Yep. Because I can't help California if I don't get elected. And I am not a name. I am not presently in the polls. So. Um, both of these issues are just full of wins everywhere with just a little edge here and there. Um, so that's why they've risen to the top of my plan. The guy that's going to make the California debt disappear. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's and good. the guy that'll get you paid for voting. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's, um, that's good. Those are good, strong. They're, they, they, do, they stand out. They're outstanding. Points, you know? Nobody else is doing them. That's, that's how I know they're good ideas. Yeah, yeah. It's because the establishment won't go near. Bernie Sanders is the closest person. That's had something like what you just yeah. described. Yeah, his, 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 you know, you know, he's in some ways my inspiration because he was likable, he has heart, he cares about people, and you really can't say that about a lot of politicians. True. But that's why I ran for president, that's why I'm running for governor, is to help people. My intentions are altruistic. I'm not in this for ego or power or money. And that's what you get with an outsider like a Bernie Sanders. Or even some people looked at the president that way. You know, that was a guy who didn't need money. He wanted to make the country great again and had a, a vision of that that probably less than half of people liked. But, you know, it was enough to get him elected. So we, we do have to think outside the box because, you know, career Republicans and Democrats, frankly, don't. And, but, but clearly it's been successful with Bernie and, and our president. Those gentlemen, you know, Bernie darn near won the nomination and, and uh, Donald got himself elected. You know, obviously people love or hate that man <laughs> with a passion, but, um, but these are outsiders and we, we need a different way of thinking. Traditional political thinking is gonna get you more of the same. And this outside of the box thinking like wanting to forgive the debt or wanting to default on some of the bonds mm -hmm. that are purchased by hedge funds that they own, then maybe that is a, the, a new, more progressive sort of thought about where we should uh, move forward into the future. Okay, good. You've opened my mind. Mm -hmm. I think you've expanded a lot of minds into this into this new realm of, of 
thinking about politics in a way that's like, could we forgive the debt? Could we invest that 20% of the budget into education? All these mm -hmm. other things. Could we get paid to vote? All this great stuff. So, and it comes from the heart, like you're saying. It's coming from the heart. It's mm -hmm. coming from a place But also of, up here. And all up here as well. Yeah. Both, both. We, yeah. we need both. Correct. And there's been too much of neither in, in our governance, in California especially. So that's why I feel called. So check out uh, June fifth. That's going to be the the primary elections in uh, in the, in California. So check that out. Let's see if uh, let's see you know Griff for Gov. Mm -hmm. So check out Griff for Gov. We'll put the links in the bio as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's walk you through a couple of the simulation questions. Sure. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, I think flowers. Stargazers, which are lilies, are my favorite, and they smell wonderful. So the smell of the flower, yeah. And just visually, I just bury my nose in a stargazer. I like receiving them, I like giving them. Yeah. To especially the women in my life. And, um, but, I, you know, I thought I was aware of this question, and to me that's, that's the easier answer. Yeah. Um, but I think the better answer is uh, human beings to me are the most beautiful thing. You know, I think of my children. Um, I think uh, not just how we look, how we are physically, but our capacity for love and compassion um, is what makes us human. So, you know, I, I've kind of left the world of banking and engineering somewhat behind. And when I became a father in particular, yeah. all of a sudden people became the most important thing to me. And I, I think that's why I belong in the Democratic Party. It's really the party of heart. And we, we, but we need to have the mind too. Yeah. And yeah. What do you think are some of the best ways to maximize human potential? Um, I think freedom and liberty, but also responsibility. Uh, you can't. That's, uh, th there's a famous, I think, Irish playwright who said that, you know, liberty, which is so cherished in this country and its founding and, and through today, uh, but it terrifies people because it also implies responsibility. Responsibility is terrifying, yeah. but it's also where the most satisfaction is in, in, in life. Yeah. When you take on responsibility as a business owner, as a parent, as a spouse, yeah. as a friend, as, as, as the son or daughter of an aging parent, um, there's nothing more satisfying than helping other people. Yeah. Like where it really counts. Yeah. That's what we need to do more of. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm looking to do in Sacramento as governor of California. I love the idea of taking on responsibility being something that people feel empowered to do, mm -hmm. um, to exercise their, their freedom and liberty, but with taking on responsibility of saying, here are the things that I want to do to make the world better, and I'm going to go and do them. Okay, mm -hmm. how about... What is something that you think is true that almost nobody else thinks is true? Oh, that's a wonderful question. Um, I, I'd have to say th there's a philosophy I discovered in, in, in libertarian philosophy, which is um, an emphasis that all human interaction is unique, and you can't make up a rule, you can't make up thousands and millions of rules, regulations to manage human behavior. Um, but I do believe in the ideal that, that all human interaction should be voluntary, consensual, and peaceful, and that there should be no violence and no threats of violence to influence human behavior. And most people agree with that, but yeah. most people are blind to seeing how much the state does that, either at the federal, state, or local level. So. This country has 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's imprisoned population. So we are at the bottom of the list of major countries in human rights when it comes to incarceration. And so we, you know, with the drug war, the, mo most people are in jail for marijuana, yeah. either using it or distributing it. Over half of them. So, you know, if we applied what we all applied to each other, to the state, you know, either the federal or state or other governments, I think we would get better governance that is for and by the people. And um, 
So there are some confronting ideas from that philosophy that really challenge the status quo you know, around things like taxation, regulation, indebtedness. And so I think we need to challenge some sacred cows with simple principles, like don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. And, and the state and the government can't do that either because either they or most often corporate or very secretive and rich moneyed interests use the state you know, to rob the poor blind. And, and we need to stop that. We need you know, to better meet the ideals of democracy and freedom instead of being you know, slaves, essentially, to, to rich bankers and corporate interests. And, and they use governments to do that. So we need to wake mm -hmm. up and red pill to that a little bit more. And uh, so my classical liberal roots in, uh, in you know, the, basically the founders of this country, we need to go back to some of that and challenge some of the sacred cows on both the left and the right and just do what's right and, and take love and take care of each other. That's what we're not doing in media and, and government and in corporations too. We need, to, we, need, we need to be more loving and take better care of each other. And we need some people, that's one thing that I learned in Orlando in 16, we need better people pursuing office and high office especially because it, it can be a very dirty business so we just need better people. We need a whole army of people running for governors and presidents or even city councils. Just better people. Politicians tend to be these sort of bottom feeder types, you know, the personalities. People, people looked at Trump and Hillary and it was like, can't we do better than these two? Mm -hmm. So, well, you can curse the darkness or light a candle and I'm lighting a candle. Good on you, Robert, for saying that. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, politics are the bottom, bottom dwellers. Feeder, yeah. yeah, the yeah. bottom feeders. Yeah. Mm. I would like to think that there are people in the political sphere that are there with their heart and brain for the people mm -hmm. doing it really for that. But then the question always comes when someone slides you that million dollar check across the table, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. We so need that, strong people to resist that. Temptation. And then that's the whole conversation is why does our political system function that way and optim optimize itself mm -hmm. that way where you can basically take a sum of money and do whatever you want with the rules. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that's a separate, more philosophical conversation, but that's also very, um, very applicable to what we're saying. So how about we talk about the, do you think there is a meaning or purpose to life? That's a wonderful question. And I am in the vast minority on that question. And I... Uh, I, the standard way of thinking is, you know, what is the meaning of life? And, and that the meaning of life is sort of the core question that I think a lot of intellectuals, educated and professional people ask. But your average person doesn't ask that. They're like, I'm hungry and I want to eat. You know, I want to go home to my wife and kids. They're, they're not in their heads, they're in their bodies. And so I think, you know, whether it's Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, or Monty Python's The Meaning of Life. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, I, there's, there's another notion that, that I learned from uh, Joseph Campbell, but he was funneling the Buddha. And, and the Buddha said life, one interpretation of what he said was that life has no meaning. You know, what's the meaning of a flower? What's the meaning of a flea? There isn't any, it's just there. And it wants to, those things want to live. And you're there and you want to live, and you do what you, what people are really motivated by is not meaning. Meaning is actually subject to something higher, which is the experience of being alive, the experience of feeling alive, and the experience of feeling the rapture of being alive. That's what drives people, not meaning. That's for academics. And, and, and you know, this is something I would debate, you know, as Sam, Harris or a Jordan Peterson on, because those gentlemen are incredible intellectuals that I've, you know, I think we've all benefited from listening to people like that, but they're intellectuals. And, and I would fall back on the Buddha and Joseph Campbell and, and what the common man experiences, which is not so much in our heads, but in our bodies is we don't want to numb ourselves to heroin or alcohol or watching Game of Thrones. 48 hours straight. We want the experience of being alive, both the highs and the lows, and not to check out. 
into this sort of numbness. Yeah. And I think meaning, in the way that many people have talked about meaning, is that falls under the experience of feeling alive. Meaning falls under feeling. Meaning is just a feeling in your head. Like my life is meaningful, I'm doing valuable work. I do charity, I, I support my family, I have a good time with my friends. Um, what are the things that make people feel alive? Eating, exercising, sex, um, the satisfaction of a good day's work, uh, getting rewarded with pay that you could then support your family with, give to charity, take a vacation, you know, surfing is a visceral feeling alive experience. Being on this show with, with you and Ron, I feel alive. This is what I live for. This is what I got out of bed for. You know, this kind of interaction, this conversation that we're having about the state of California, 40 million souls, I feel alive. When I go to a concert, I like rock music principally, but many other forms. I feel alive when I'm either in the audience or I'm on stage singing because mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. sing as well. So that, I think, is what we all live for. And to an academic, that may mostly be an intellectual where it falls under meaning, but to me, meaning is under feeling. Feelings are more important uh, than facts. The human experience of feeling, this, this is, I think, the edge the Democrats have over Republicans, is that feelings are more important. Thoughts and ideas and some of the engineering and economics behind you know, like addressing the debt, which we talked about earlier, that's where you apply things like science, engineering, and mathematics. But you can't say that I feel that gravity doesn't exist. Well, somebody is free to feel or think whatever they want, but it is a fact that gravity exists. So, so, then, the, so then the... We can feel it. It's yeah. what's keeping me in this chair. So then that, that, that is the argument then, is mm -hmm. that feelings make us feel alive and they're incredible and we need to experience as many as possible and get people excited about that but also facts don't necessarily f and, and meaning fall under feeling because if facts fall under feeling then you can fall into a world where facts are mm -hmm. absolutely irrelevant to people's feelings right and that's not a good place either so it's almost as though they're kind of supposed to be together absolutely you got to have your facts straight Ronald Reagan a, a former governor of the state he said facts are persistent things and we have to get them right or as close to an authentic representation of reality as possible because if your feelings are based on facts that are out of line with with such realities as gravity then you're going to have a hard time. Yeah. How about are we alone in the cosmos? That's a great question. I don't know. I don't have a lot of data on, you know, I know they're starting to find water and, and, and at least traces of life that perhaps was on Mars. Um, and I think it's an important question, and there's lots of great science as well as science fiction is, is where I get most of my, when I think about life elsewhere. I get that from the movies and television to the extent I still watch those things. Um, but I think a more important question is, are we alone here? And I, a very important thing to me is connection. And sometimes I feel like an alien. <laughs> you know, when I, at a political function, I talk about the debt or paying people to vote, a lot of people in the political and media world look at me like, that's crazy, you know, and, and then I feel a bit alienated. Or, but then I talk with somebody like you or a lot of other people that I've talked to on the street, and, and they love the idea. So I think isolation and disconnection is, is one of our biggest problems in this country and in this culture. So I, th I think it's important to, to stay connected emotionally to yourself and other people because we're social animals. And so... I think the question of are we alone in the cosmos speaks to the, psych the psyche saying, I'm too alone. I want more connection in my life. I want more touch. I want more positive relationships. And, you know, we don't necessarily have to look to the cosmos for that, but it's a wonderful fantasy. And it's a terrific scientific and, and imaginatory question. It's a relevant question. Um, but, but to me, the psychologist in me hears that question, and what I hear is, you know, 
am I alone? I'm t I know in my life, and most people I know, there's too much isolation and loneliness and not enough social connection with friends and family. And the Bay Area is really, mm -hmm. scores very low in that. So I get connection wherever I can find it, with my kids, with my friends. This feels, this is a very connective experience for me. Ron chiming into the conversation, mm -hmm. our producer, and so. I, I, th I think that's the big problem. It's, it's the disconnected person who walks into a school and shoots it up. So that's, that's I think, a manifestation of disconnection, isolation, and, and loneliness. We're very grateful to have had the Connect team here. Yeah. Uh, human connection, mm. peace, through doing things like even just putting your, you know, putting your hand up and just going like, mm. Mm. That feels good. Like that, yeah. yeah. Just the little things like this, mm -hmm. you know, and what and what just that touch does, and it feels good. Yeah, it feels good, and you can look at somebody, and you can just really feel that palm to palm connection. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you think we're in a computer simulation? That's a great. I love the Matrix, especially the first film. The trilogy is great, but the first film was just. Fantastic, and it's it's really I think metaphorical. To sometimes it feels like we're in a soulless, disconnected computer simulation, and and I, again psychologically I think that's where that film speaks to the psyche, is because sometimes it feels like we're in a machine, instead of in a more touchy feely human mammal experience. So yeah. I don't think we are in one, but it's a wonderful. Because it's possible, we are. It's possible we're just batteries for the machine in the matrix, and this is a neurokinetic simulation that we're in. Um, but um, outside of that, I think that film is metaphorical to the human experience of feeling like we're in something that isn't really human, that isn't even real. And so I think culturally what I would like to be just even for myself and my kids and everybody is that we don't feel like we're in a computer. We need to be warm, fuzzy human beings in a big cuddle pile. We need more of that than this kind of machines walking around in a big machine trying to eke out a meaningless existence. Warm, fuzzy human Co beings in a big cuddle, cuddle pile. pile. Yeah. That's beautiful. <laughs> in a big cuddle pile. Awesome. And that human connection, that ability to uh, stay open-minded to concepts like potentially um, taking our debt and forgiving it and uh, paying voters, um, these are the things that you care, you care about, human connection. I, I, I really appreciate having you here, mm -hmm. having you on the show. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you, Robert. Such a pleasure. Mr. Griff. Mm -hmm. Governor Griff, maybe one day. Hopefully, if if California is ready, then uh, ready for, you know, frankly, a, a golden age potentially, um, then then we'll get one. Yeah, and it requires this outside of the box thinking, and maybe you know, check out some of his links, check out some of the work, see if it's of interest to you. We definitely highly recommend at least considering becoming educated about these different options and what it would all entail. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for tuning in. If you guys had a good time, like, comment, subscribe. Definitely share the content with other people. Get them also thinking about this. How can we build a better world? And join us on Patreon. Support us. Mm -hmm. The lights, the internet, the cameras, the action, the safe place for people. We would love to love to have you join the community. And that's it. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we got a bunch of good content as well coming at you. So. Get pumped. Woo! All right.